Joining Jim on stage, MCUL president and COO, Ken Ross. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jim, for joining us here in Michigan. Great to hear the update from CUNA. And now I'm pleased to introduce State Representative Lee Chatfield. Lee is the current Speaker Pro Tem of the Michigan House of Representatives. He was born and raised in northern Michigan and lives in Levering with his wife Stephanie and their five children. He represents Chippewa, Emmett, Mackinac, and Sheboygan counties. He chairs the Government Operations and Michigan Competitiveness Committees. He's been a supporter and friend of the Michigan Credit Union Movement, including supporting our 2016 update of the Michigan Credit Union Act. Please help me welcome Representative Lee Chatfield. Well, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here, and uh, welcome to Northern Michigan. I, I will tell you, I had kind of a speech kind of written out, and I was, I was ready to go, and then my confidence started waning because I asked Ken about five minutes before I got on the stage. I said, hey, are there any other legislators here? He said, no, you're the only one. And I said, well, which legislator did you have last year? And he said, well, we had Governor Rick Snyder, so good luck. And I, <laughs> I mean, talk about a significant step down, um, but, I was happy to hear your national chairman say just a second ago, uh, you do have to listen to millennials because sometimes they have things to say. And uh, fortunately, you have one in front of you right now. Um, but before I, thank you, thank you for that, thank you. Uh, before I get going and kind of give you a, a little bit of an update about what we've been working on uh, in Lansing, I, I truly do have to thank some, some people and individuals I have over to my right, your left. Um, with, with Ken, with Jordan, and Haley, who are all along the wall, because I will tell you this, in Michigan, we have term limits. You're in the legislature, and then you're out the next day. We have a very quick revolving door, and for us to do our jobs, we need certain information, we need knowledge, we need data that's presented to us, and I will tell you this, you have tireless advocates in Lansing who are keeping us updated on the issues. I will tell you this, when I have a question, they are in my office. Quite frankly, even when I don't have a question, they are in my office. Um, so I want to give them a round of applause for the work that they do on behalf of your organization in Lansing. So in Michigan, I'm from northern Michigan, born and raised here. You can go down the road to Petoskey and you know, right along the bay, beautiful area. All five of my children have uh, the same opportunity to grow up where I grew up. They're born in the same hospital that I was. So I, I am a lifelong Michigan resident, and I want to set my roots here. Michigan is important to me. Our recovery is important to me. And as you look over the last 10 years in Michigan, quite frankly, it does not matter if I speak to the Rotary Club, if I speak to the Republican Party, the Green Party, the Democratic Party, the Kiwanis Group, it does not matter. The fact is, when I ask the question, how many of you think Michigan has come a long way and had an economic recovery over the past 10 years, everyone can see it. Everyone can feel it. And we've implemented a lot of changes, of which I'm proud of in Lansing. When you look at the state of Michigan, you look at our unemployment, when it's at a 20-year low, when you look at workforce participation, we've added over 500,000 private sector jobs in our state. When you look at population growth, we're finally growing again. Most people don't realize Michigan was the only state in the first decade of this century to actually lose population. We were going in the wrong direction, but we've done a lot of good things to bring our economy back. And I'm telling you this, a growing economy is not just good for Southern Michigan, it's great for Northern Michigan, it's great for credit unions. It means that our kids or your grandkids can move back to the state and set up shop here, raise their family here. That's what it means to be from Michigan. Michigan, in the last 10 years, leads the nation in growth and manufacturing jobs. That's something we can be proud of. That's what it means to be a Michigander, going to work every day, supporting your family, investing in your community. And I will tell you this, I've learned a lot from these individuals about credit unions, but my actual first experience with a credit union 
was 10 years ago. I was 20 years old, and I, I, I was 22 years old. I, I was in my 20s when I first ran for office. I apologize, not anymore. And I was looking to purchase a home. I had, just, I had just graduated from college, and I came back, and I was in northern Michigan, and I had a bank that I had done banking with uh, my entire life. My parents banked with them, and, and, I, and I was attempting to get a home loan. And I, I could not help but realize when earlier Jim had mentioned you have to make people see the impact of a credit union. And I remember it, it was taking months. And I had a friend, I believe he's here right now, he might not call me a friend, but I will, qual I will qualify him as a friend, Jason Friel, who was working over at Onaway Community Federal Credit Union, now known as Awaken. And I called him and I said, Jason, what is, I know you're in banking, aren't you? And he goes, well, I'm with a credit union, but you know, we're, they're a step below us, but what's your question? And, uh, <laughs> and I said, I said, this guy is attempting to get me a home loan, all my information's there, the data's there, everything's set. I've been with him for two months and he's operating 13 different branches. And I said, I know, it's, I know it's past office hours, but can I come in next week? He goes, why don't you just drive over right now, I'll stick around at the office, we'll meet and we'll talk about it. I said, like, tonight? And it was about seven o'clock. He said, yeah, just, just drive on over. I'm like, man, this is good service here, all right? So I get over there and within 30 days, my wife and I were in our new home. And that is the service of a credit union. And that's the personal service, that's the personal touch. That meant a lot to me, and it's, it's been great working with your advocates in Lansing. But I will tell you this, we've come a long way in Michigan, but we still have many more areas we can improve in. If you were to ask me if I could give you about a two minute rundown of what I think we need to focus on in Michigan over the next couple years, and what our legislative priorities will be in Lansing, I would say number one, we can do more for our residents with lowering the cost of living. And when I talk about the cost of living, the single largest issue we have in our state right now, when compared to other Midwest states or even around the country, is the high cost of car insurance. The fact is, we spend in Michigan, when compared to Midwest states, we spend on average $1,000 more per household per year on car insurance. And think about what the economic activity could be if that $1,000 was back in their pockets. Think about what that would mean for education. Think about what that would mean for our roads. Think about what that would mean for credit unions, for tourism, for Northern Michigan. We need to do more. I do believe we have a system that no longer works and we need to, Republicans, Democrats need to come together. This should not be a partisan issue and you deserve a solution. So that is one thing we are dedicated to doing, lowering the cost of car insurance. But I will say number two, close behind that, we've come a long way, but we have to ask ourselves, what, what can we continue to do to let people know around the country, Michigan is a place you can move to. And I will tell you this, we can brand ourselves as pure Michigan all we want. But when people come across our state border and the roads are crumbling, it's tough to keep that fresh on their mind. Now, I will tell you this. Our funding for roads this year is at an all-time high. We are dedicating more state dollars to infrastructure and roads than we ever have in the history of Michigan, but it is not enough. We need to completely change how we're funding our roads and our infrastructure. We have several ideas that I think uh, we will be tackling within the next couple of years, but the fact is we need to do more. I stood with Governor Snyder recently when he announced that the state of Michigan was going to lead the way with other Midwest states and making an offer simply to the federal government when it comes to infrastructure regarding the Sioux Locks. We have been talking about building an additional Sioux Lock for 30 years. Congress has authorized construction twice, but has not appropriated the funds. Well, the state of Michigan took the lead and said, we will put up the first $50 million towards it. We'll work with other states to partner with them to present to you, the federal government, a way that we can get this funded. When we look at our roads and infrastructure, those are the big things that we need to get done. When you understand the impact that the Sioux Locks has on the steel industry, which is the backbone of America, backbone of the Midwest, we need to get that done. But number three, I would add, we need to continue to make ourselves attractive to businesses across the country. When they look at Michigan, they need to see open for business. Now I will tell you this, gone are the days, for the most part in Michigan, when people come to my office hours or anyone else and say, you know what, I want a job, but there are no jobs available. The fact is now, you know who's coming to my office hours now? 
business owners. And they say there are jobs available and no one is willing to work these jobs. And we need to provide a better certainty in the product these businesses are going to invest in. What we need to tackle, and this is, this is an issue around the entire country, and Michigan has led the way. You should be proud to know that Michigan has actually paid down the most money on long-term debt of any state in the country the last 10 years. We're taking care of our budget, and we're paying down on our debts. But we need to tackle, number three, we need to tackle our unfunded liabilities. If you remember, just a few short years ago, Detroit went through their bankruptcy. If we don't tackle this issue in a responsible way, setting politics aside and working with municipalities to ensure that they're properly funded, we will have several Detroits across our state. So we need to do everything we, everything we can to have good budget practices in our state. So I would tell you this, I am proud to be from the state of Michigan. I'm even prouder to be from northern Michigan. It's great that you are all up here and we have the opportunity to host you. And I would tell you this, I wanna thank all of you for your investment in our state. I wanna thank you for your tireless work in improving our state, and it has been an honor to partner with you and your advocates in Lansing as we move our state forward. So God bless you, thank you for everything that you do, and thank you for having me this morning. Thank you, Representative Chatfield. Very much appreciate your presence here this morning. And now we have uh, a message from U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow, as we all know, who was elected in the year 2000. She was our 2013 MCUL Federal Lawmaker of the Year. In 2017, just last year, when tax reform was going, reform was going through Congress, she provided us with a strong statement of support, which is no surprise, because as we all know, Senator Stabenow uh, first formed a relationship with the Michigan Credit Union community when she was State Representative Stabenow and then State Senator Stabenow and has carried on that support to the U.S. Senate. She was particularly instrumental in helping getting passage of Senate Bill 2155, the regulatory relief package which just passed. She worked the cloakrooms for us and was one of two Michigan U.S. Senators that supported the regulatory reform legislation. So we were pleased to extend our endorsement of her for her 2018 re-election bid in December of 2017. Now let's take a look at a brief message from Senator Sabinaw. Good morning, I wish I could be there with you. A special hello to Dave Adams and Ken Ross. Thanks so much for your leadership. And Karen Church, CEO of Elga Credit Union, congratulations on being sworn in as chair of the Michigan Credit Union League. I want to thank all of you for the work you do every day to help Michigan families and businesses and communities thrive. As a credit union member myself, I know firsthand how important your services are to your members and to our state's economy. That's why I'm committed to preserving your traditional status as tax-exempt, not-profit, not-for-profit, community-based organizations. And I was pleased that your tax-exempt status was preserved in recent tax reform legislation. And as a member of the Senate Finance Committee, I'll continue to defend your status from those who would change or eliminate it. We know that Michigan communities depend on healthy, local financial institutions to help people buy homes, start businesses, further their education. And that's why I supported the regulatory reform bill that recently passed the Senate. Our member-owned credit unions which did not cause the financial crisis, have been harmed by a growing regulatory burden. It's forced some to close their doors and increased consolidation, which is bad for Michigan consumers. This legislation will allow regulators to focus their resources on the Wall Street banks that were the heart of the financial crisis. And it will cut red tape for you and free up capital for Michigan families and businesses. You know, whether you're helping a young family purchase their first home, 
providing the capital for a local bakery to expand to a second location, or giving people the information they need to make wise financial decisions. Michigan's credit unions are making a difference every day in our communities. So thank you for all you do to keep Michigan's economy moving forward. I'm proud to be your partner. Enjoy the rest of the conference. So we're lucky to have uh, some pretty high-profile folks joining us already this morning. We had Jim Nussel, uh, our CUNA CEO, um, joining us for the second time in the last couple years. Very appreciative of his presence and comments. Uh, Lee Chatfield, who you just heard before Senator Stabenow, if things go his way in the elections come November, he'll be the next Speaker of the House. Uh, he's been working hard on positioning himself for that leadership opportunity, and we very much appreciate his long-term support for credit unions here in Michigan. He's got a bright future, and of course, Senator Stabenow has been a longtime supporter of our industry and movement. I also want to recognize uh, Director Pat McFarland from DIFFS, who's with us today. He and his team are circulating around the conference, so grab him or John Koloff, Leanne O'Brien, any of that, those guys. Feel free to bend their ear. And we also have a special guest uh, this morning. Um, as we all know, uh, Children's Miracle Network is at the heart of a lot of the good work that we do as, as a credit union movement. We have a particular commitment to CMN. We've got an advocate for CMN with us this morning, Johnny Hendricks and his family. He was diagnosed with leukemia at age 13 in, in the year 2013, and at age 11, he is a powerful advocate. Advocacy is very important, and he brings it to the table for CMN. So I'd like to take the opportunity for you to join me in welcoming the Hendricks family. Please stand up and be recognized. Johnny, please uh, thank you, accept my thanks for joining us this morning. He'll be with us at the silent and uh, live auction this evening, so make sure you say howdy when you see him and uh, recognize his commitment to CMN and all the good work that they do. Now, before we jump into uh, some comments on the current landscape here in Michigan, I just want to give you a few quick fun facts. At, about this convention. As you might be aware, we've got a good crowd this year. Traverse City is one of our smaller locations. You know we rotate between Detroit, Grand Rapids, and Traverse City. This is our smallest location, but we have 1,269 attendees at this convention. About 600 of those are credit union folks who either are volunteers or working for a credit union. 109 credit unions represented uh, right in the mid-40s percentage of our overall credit union population, uh, which is pretty awesome. And to support all of you here, we have 33 MCUL staff. You know that Renee Worth and her team work very hard to make this event uh, work and go off seamlessly. Janet Ormsby over here runs the entire event pretty much. So if you see Janet, make sure you say thank you. We know it's a team effort, though. Everybody pitches in. We'll be collectively drinking about 281 gallons of coffee while we're here. We'll eat 400 box lunches. Most of you like turkey. That's apparently the most popular. We'll be drinking over 1,000 cans of, so of pop. And we've got an awesome group of crashers here. What? All right, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about the focus for my remarks this morning will be our ideas in action. In doing so, I wanna take a look back at our history as credit unions as a movement. I wanna connect that to our activities today and then take a look forward to what some of those challenges are that Jim and other speakers have been talking about. So I'm gonna dial way back to the beginning of the credit union movement here in America and in Michigan, um, it was a time, it was about 100 years ago when things started happening. Um, 
And the predicate, the, the reason why credit unions were formed in many ways began with, if you read, uh, if you've ever had occasion to read Roy Bergeron's uh, book on the beginnings of the credit union, it's called Crusade, The Fight for Economic Democracy. In that book, chapter one, page one, paragraph one, line one, is the statement, in the beginning, there is usury. And that's really the start of the story of the credit union movement here in America, in my view. Credit unions were formed in many ways to answer in the marketplace the problem of usury. And what is usury? Usury is just a legal way of saying charging people illegally high interest rates for money. And credit unions were created to solve that problem back in uh, 1918 and here in the state of Michigan in 1925 when the first Credit Union Act was passed. Now when credit unions were first formed, it was at a point in history where there was massive social change. We were moving from an agrarian society where people were largely living in and working on farms and moving in large numbers to cities. It was the age of the machine when people were uh, working in factories for the very first time, mass production was being introduced in a large way across the country. The American dream had taken root. People wanted that dream, the ability to have a home, have a family, engage in the consumer, developing consumer culture. But that takes capital, both for businesses and individuals, as we all know. You have to have access to capital. And in, in that time, there was no consumer lending landscape like we have today. There were no credit cards, there were no credit scores. In fact, banks didn't even have consumer lending departments at that time. They loaned to businesses, people who had collateral. The way you got money if you were an individual at that time was you could either borrow from your family, if they had means that they could afford to borrow you a few bucks, or you could go to more sketchy folks like salary lenders, which is like a precursor to a payday lender, they would give you some money today and they would get assigned a, a portion of your future salary. Or you could go even more sketchy and borrow from a loan shark. And they enforce their terms by breaking legs. So an even dicier proposition. Into this environment, came a fellow named Edward Filene. He's one of the forefathers four of the credit union movement nationally. Now most people know the name Filene from Filene's department store, Filene's basement. He was an innovator. He was one of the family that owned the store. He grew it into the, a large department store at the turn of the century. He was an innovator in merchandising. He came up with things like the very first money back guarantee it's common today. He was the first guy to actually do this. He was also a big fan of truth in advertising, something that a lot of retailers today could learn a lesson from. And of course, the filings basement, bargain basement concept of moving, uh, moving merchandise from the main floor down to a discount rack, and then after that to charity as a business model. Now, Filene was very interested in the economic well-being of not only his employees, but also of workers in general. He saw those salary lenders lining up at the pay gate uh, at, the, at his accounting um, department, trying to get their fingers into his employees' paychecks before the employee got paid on Fridays, literally lined up, and thought, I need to connect a few dots here. If these employees are having most of their salary taken by salary lenders, they're not going to have enough money to buy goods and service or goods from Filene's department store. So maybe there's something wrong with this picture. Much like Henry Ford, he understood that you have to have people in a mass machine age able to buy the products. They can't just make the products because there's not enough rich people to buy mass produced products. You have to have average working people able to take advantage of those products. He was not though 
doing this for charitable reasons. He wasn't a communist or a socialist. He was a capitalist. He was looking out for Filene's department store. He knew long term it was in his interest for his workers to be protected. Now, when he was on one of his buying trips in India, he saw micro lending communities, cooperatives, where workers were getting together amongst themselves because they didn't have access to traditional capital sources and forming borrowing circles where people would put in the kitty and then someone would loan out from the kitty. They'd get reasonable rates of return and, and, and small and reasonable uh, interest. That crystallized in his mind the need for something similar in America, which was the forerunner of which eventually became the credit union movement. He invested a million of his own dollars over a period of a couple decades in hiring organizers and passing laws around the states. And he had a vision. This is 100 years ago in, 2000, or in 1918. He had a vision of hundreds and thousands of credit unions, a grassroots crusade where credit unions would be organized, which then would come together in, in individual states and form organizations to protect their interest in those states so those laws couldn't be repealed. Because he knew the small lenders and the bankers would eventually want to squash credit unions. And he also envisioned a national organization serving both credit unions at the local level and states to protect their interest in Congress. A hundred years ago, he envisioned the three-tier system that we enjoy today, and which was a system that helped drive the public policy initiatives that, we, that Jim talked about earlier in both tax reform and Senate Bill 2155. His ideas form the basis and the core of what we know today as, as the modern credit union movement. Again, he didn't do these things for charitable reasons, although they have charitable benefits. He did these things for interest of self-help. He believed that people needed financial autonomy and dignity, and they derived that by having choices, having control of their own finances, and not to be a slave of either employer or lenders. He believed in pooling resources, people helping people, those phrases that resonate, not for profit, not for charity, but for service. Those things came from Edward Filene. Now, that was 100 years ago. And today, some of those same folks that he was dealing are back. They've never really gone away, but they're back with a vengeance today because while Filene dealt with and observed in his communities small mom and pop lenders, small loan lenders who are taking advantage of his workers. Today, the modern face of usury are large corporations, multi-state many times, funded by large Wall Street banks or hedge funds in many cases, with huge amounts of capital behind them. Payday lenders, title lenders, rent to own, pawn shops, it's big business to take advantage of people today in America, unfortunately. It, the financial services landscape can be extremely scary for a consumer. So against this backdrop, Americans are more unsettled than ever. And cutting this amongst uh, a few different age groups, we can look, first of all, for retirees. Retirees who should be at a point in their career where they're taking advantage of a life well planned, golden years. Unfortunately, studies have shown that 52% of retirees over 55 have no pension and no retirement savings whatsoever. 55 years and older, 52% have no pension and no savings whatsoever. Those who do save, their nest egg on average for 65 and older only generates about $405 a month in income. Coupled with Social Security, that's a very thin margin to live on. As Filene said, it's important to have financial security, not to be reliant on the charity of others, because when you have financial security, you can have a dignified retirement. You have choices you can make. And don't feel as though you're a burden to family or the government. Now, working adults who still have some time, the picture looks fairly bleak as well, unfortunately, 
for many of our fellow Americans. 26% are either unbanked or underbanked. 28% have no pension, no retirement savings so far. 32% have variable income, so it's very hard for them to predict month to month what kind of uh, money they'll have coming in. And importantly, 24 million Americans carry medical debt currently from the year before, a full 10% of the population. This all goes to a picture of financial resiliency. And you've heard us talk about this statistic before, that if you had an emergency and you had to come up with $400 today because you had a car that broke down or a medical issue, 44% of the people would have to either borrow or they have to sell something to come up with 400 bucks. Now you might think that's pretty, pretty scary, but actually it's better than five years ago. In 2013, when this was last asked, 50% of the population wouldn't be able to come up with $400. So we've marginally increased 6% between 50 down to 44, but it still shows that many people are on the edge financially. Also, 55% of adults carry credit card balances, 30% report they're finding it just difficult. They're tired and anxious because they're just getting by and they can't keep their nose right above the water. 23% report a med major medical incident in the last year. And with our youngest folks, we've talked about millennials a few times from this stage. The biggest issue for many millennials is student debt, as we all know. It's estimated that in the aggregate, our youngest generation just coming out of college owes $1.4 trillion in student debt. That's trillion with a T nationally. The average Michigan student owes, comes out of college with just over $30,000 in debt, which is kind of scary to start out a career and a family. It affects the choices that people will have to make based on that reality. Now I want to connect some of that to some of these ideas in action in the credit union movement today, because it's important for us to talk about our values and talk about the ideas that we hold uh, dear, but it's also very important to live those values and to model that. That's the next level for us, is to put those ideas in action. Now, as we've talked about, we had a big year this year. Grassroots act activity and, and engaging with our, our government uh, representatives, our policymakers and regulators is incredibly important for us. And we saw the results with both tax reform and Senate Bill 2155. Those were great accomplishments, but we have a lot of work to do. We all know and we talk about the fact that we need to update the Federal Credit Union Act. That's going to be a heavy lift for this industry, for this movement, because unlike 2155, where the bankers were right at our sides, the bankers for a Federal Credit Union Act update are going to be opposing us. We're going to have to break through that clutter and work to educate policymakers on why this is important for us as a movement for our future. We also have quite a few challenges in the state level with our modern day uh, usurious lenders in the form of payday lenders. Payday lenders want to expand their powers under state law. You all know generally the payday lending transaction. When it was passed in 2005, relatively small loan, $600, paid back within 30 days, triple digit interest rates. They'd like to now do installment loans, $2,500, paid back over 24 months. <clears throat> if I paid back a loan over 24 months at the triple digit interest rates that they charge, I'd be paying back over $8,300 to that payday lenders over a two year period. That's bad for Michigan families, that's bad for communities. That is the modern day face of usury, which is why we strongly oppose the expansion of payday lending, which is why we've got some work to do to educate our policymakers on why this can't pass. Additionally, we've got some work to do in the area of data breach. We know that federally this is not going to pass in the near future. We're not yet to the point at which we can get federal relief, 
but we do have a bill at the state level. That bill's got two hearings. It's gonna have a third one in the near future. We need your help in contacting state representatives and senators to tell them why this is such a pressing issue for credit unions. We're literally losing millions of dollars a year unnecessarily to fraud due to data breaches. We've got work to do to get this bill passed. And Jim recognized us in our CU Link campaign here in Michigan, a great kind of iteration of what they're doing at the national level. But we have to be ever vigilant to cultivate and invest in cooperative advertising here in the state of Michigan. We can't afford to drop the ball in this area. We invest in better than $2 million in advertising annually. For the first year in 2018, we've got ads running from January all the way to December. We're never down. Close to 30% of that investment is in digital. Why? Because we're focusing increasingly on the youngest consumers to introduce them to the benefits of the credit union. That's the future, so we need to be where they are, and that's on that phone on those digital platforms. I will tell you that if we drop the ball on this one, we'll have long-term consequences, because if we don't tell our story, if we don't tell our story, there are people who will want to tell our story for us. And the story that they tell won't be as flattering as the one that we tell. Our, our marketplace opponents and the bankers would love to tell policymakers all about credit unions and all the bad things they think we're doing. When we talk to them and they, we tell our story, they love uh, that story and want to be part of it. So we have to continue to invest in cooperative advertising. And we also need to step up our leadership game we know that in the next 10 years, there's gonna be an incredible turnover in senior leadership in credit unions, both on the professional side and on boards of directors. Michigan's no different in this respect. We've got a lot of senior, well-seasoned CEOs and other senior managers, and we've got a lot of well-seasoned board members who've been involved for a long time. We need to focus on cultivating that next generation of leaders and to make sure that they have opportunities to take advantage of today so that they're ready to have the baton passed to them. We're, we're doing this here at the Michigan Credit Union League by innovative programs like Leadership at 11, where people get an intensive multi-month process where they can get exposure to high quality leadership skills, where they get feedback loops, where they understand how they can improve everything from public speaking, presentation skills, networking, on and on and on. We need our people not to be 10s on scales of one to 10, we need them to be 11s because our competition is budding at our heels. We've got work to do in this area. Finally, social mission is at the core of what we all feel good about the credit union movement, how we can make differences in communities and individuals, members in their lives. The work is never done. Credit unions are always innovating I want to take a moment just to look at an example of a little program that's developed in Manistee, Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula. With a grant from MCUF, Limestone FCU found a way to not only support their strategic plan, but to also grow student financial and entrepreneurial education. They decided to apply for the, the grant, um, got together with the kids, and they decided to start the coffee shop. Well, Limestone has helped us a lot getting it started because obviously we're kids, so it's kind of hard to start a business on our own. We have um, everyone from the credit union coming over and they're just talking to us. We have Alan Barr from the EDC come over and talk us through how to do a business plan. And so from scratch, they thought through, you know, what kind of business, what structure, picked a name, had several really great names to pick from and picked the grind. This is a very unique project. I've not seen or heard of anything that, that started with a little bit of seed money and then from scratch to allow students to imagine what something might be as a business and then make it happen. The endeavor even caught the attention of Governor Rick Snyder. Hello and congratulations on your grand opening. This is a great day for the people of Manistique. So today is the grand opening of the Grind Coffee House, which is a culmination of two and a half years of work, which started with a fast and furious grant application to the Michigan Credit Union Foundation. 
but we quickly kind of gathered some community leaders, um, our local Schoolcraft County Tourism and Commerce Director, uh, the school officials, the Board of Directors of Limestone, myself, and some team members from the Credit Union. Uh, from there, it's just, we hit the ground running. It's been a lot of ups and downs, kind of a roller coaster. I mean, it was frustration and then it was happiness when we got our building permit and the beginning of this place, it was so run down and deteriorated and now we're here. So it's an incredible feeling and it's very emotional. Um, I think it's really important uh, for other credit unions to seek out opportunities like this. It's beneficial for not just students, but people in the communities as well. So the $20,000 grant turned into $200,000 of material and, and donated time. So it was really leveraged better than you could have hoped. So I hope you'll join me. I hope you'll join me tomorrow morning at the awards breakfast where um, uh, Limestone Federal Credit Union uh, and other uh, awardees will be honored for their um, contributions to the credit union movement here in the state of Michigan. What I really love about this, um, this program was where it started from. When I talked to uh, Jennifer Watson at Limestone, they, they've got such a great story in terms of they didn't start out thinking, hey, we want to develop a credit union run coffee shop. What they started out with a, was with a small kind of junky building right next to the credit union, right across the street, came back to the credit union, and they could have just decided, we're going to just knock that down and make a little parking lot, you know? Uh, but they got to talking amongst themselves. They had a great partnership with the high school, and they thought maybe this could somehow turn into something. So they had some conversations, engaged with their community, with that high school. There was a lot of energy around the idea of doing something unique and different. The students were excited. So they did an iterative process to try to figure out how, how they could use it. They came up with a coffee shop. Then they came up with a name. Then they came up with a business plan. Then they decided we need to get trained. So they, became, they got trained on becoming baristas. And it, it, it uh, domino effect one after another after another. At the end of the day, they had this awesome opening where you saw Governor Snyder and lots of public officials and everybody in the community was super excited to be part of this. It started out with a $20,000 grant from the Michigan Credit Union Foundation to try to make a vision into reality. And then they worked with the community and they came up with $200,000 in matching grants. Now that's awesome, tenfold. They could have never thought at the beginning that this would somehow blossom into something so amazing. This is in a small town where there was no Starbucks. There is no coffee shop. This is the coffee shop. And what's great about it is it not only was an innovative program that used a, a space and created something for these students, but it also taught them so much. It crystallized in so many ways what's best about the credit union movement. Like Filene said, self-help. People aren't looking for a handout. They want to learn and be part of something bigger. And this is a great example where those students came away with collaboration skills, business skills, technical skills, getting training, a work ethic. Everything that we talk about as being important in the credit union movement comes together in a project like that. So we've got a lot of work, work to do in the social mission area to find projects like this. Not the next coffee shop, but the next something else that crystallizes in the same way a number of different strands that benefits not only members, but communities as well. This is people helping people in action. We've got work to do to make this happen, similarly, all across the state of Michigan. All right, so we've looked at where we've been, where we came from as a movement, where we started from, some of those, where some of those core concepts that underlie our principles came from. Talked a little bit about where we are today and the work that we've got to do in the future, work that we'll do together. I've got a favor to ask. As you may know, because particularly if you're in a credit union, the Michigan Credit Union uh, League is very solicitous of your opinions. We're constantly sending out surveys saying, please give us your opinion on things. Why do we do that? We do that because we're a continually evolving organization. Whether it's for events like this or our day-to-day -day operations, we are in a state of continuous improvement across the year. So I've got a favor to ask. 
help us with our annual membership survey, which is live right now until the end of June. Quick survey to help us gauge and provide a baseline on how we're doing. Are we meeting your needs and how can we improve? You can either email us at this link or you can go on your MCUL ACNE app, which you hopefully downloaded. You'll find a button on there, click it, give us your quick feedback, let us know how we're doing and how we can improve. That would be very helpful to us. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the ACE, first of all. I mean, Renee and Janet and her team put on, are putting on an awesome event for us. They came up with the most awesome weather possible <laughs> in a beautiful location. As Dave mentioned, we've raised 40 plus thousand dollars already for Children's Miracle Network. We have a goal of over $100,000 at this convention. The annual uh, live auction and silent auction is tonight. So please bid early, bid off, and bid high, because we've got $60,000 plus to raise for tonight for Children's Miracle Network, and to together I can think we can do it. I wanna thank each of you for letting me do what I do on your behalf. I feel incredibly privileged and lucky to have the opportunity to represent credit unions here in the state of Michigan. We have a great league, and more importantly, we have a great movement here in Michigan. Thank you very much for everything.